Hello and welcome to the Second Drafts Podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. I'm EJ. And today on Second Drafts, we'll be talking about self-editing. So basically, everyone knows what editing is, and self-editing is your personal side to it, what you can do to improve the strength of your novel and make it better than it was before. Uh, so we're going to just go over a couple tips and tricks that uh, we use ourselves and uh, basically so that you can take those and apply those to your writing. So one thing uh, that I do neglect a little bit but uh, should be doing is reading uh, because reading other people's works can help you out with uh, your own writing. Uh, the people who have been doing it for years, you know, they've been doing it for far longer than you and, uh, potentially <laughs> <laughs> far longer than me, at least. And oh, well. they're definitely more successful. <laughs> I'd say if you're, uh, yeah. if you're uh Stephen King and you're watching uh, our podcast, then, <laughs> you know, you, you don't need to be here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you I'm definitely glad, but <laughs> yeah. Kudos. But, uh, yeah, it was Stephen King that actually said, uh, if you don't have time to read, then you don't have time to write. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I would not, I would not make Stephen King proud then. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it definitely is a big part of it. And, uh, learning to analyze different authors' writing and, um, kind of deconstructing it, as it were to find out how it works and uh, if, say, you even like a particular scene, like what you like about it, like analyzing it and just figuring out that and then uh, almost reverse engineering it, as it were. So like looking at the descriptions and uh, the action and the dialogue and character building and that sort of thing. And it's all just lessons kind of waiting to be found in these hmm. uh, bestseller best bestseller, <laughs> in these bestsellers oh, yeah. yeah the ultimate self study guide it's every book you've ever read yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh when you do something like this you must just be wary of uh how you go about it of course you you don't want to just outright copy other people you know mm-hmm. You know, take things easy as you go through it. Um, not every technique you see in a in a in a in another writer's book will necessarily work for your story. You're going to have to use some judgment there, some instinct. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're going to try to use a particular style or technique, just like that in your own book where it doesn't really fit, it's uh, you know your readers are going to notice. They're going to it's going to feel like it's just been shoehorned in there, and. Uh, you the better thing to do would be to look at it in a very general way you know look at similar genres to yours um and learn the 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 concepts behind the technique instead of just taking you know the thing as is and then make it your own and then you know put your own spin on it and just use it as inspiration Mm -hmm. that you get from someone else's work (laughs) yeah like it it might not Uh, translate is easily over uh, but like say with the song of ice and fire uh, or with the game of thrones tv show uh, i definitely like to kind of analyze that because they do characters just so well i find and uh, just looking at the way that the character kind of builds over time and changes over time like they're never really static and so like i kind of like to bring that in there as well as even uh, just how they like to kind of kill off their characters, like not being afraid <laughs> to do that almost. Like, yeah, obviously can't do it in the, in the same, uh, uh, volume <laughs> as the Game yeah. of Thrones. But, uh, it yeah. definitely. I, I don't have enough characters to <laughs> kill <laughs> in that way. But, uh, definitely like there's something to be learned from there, I believe. And, uh, I feel that. Uh, even just the characterization, if you take it from that general standpoint, looking at those books mm. is really, really well done. So, yeah. 
And another thing... Yeah, I like to... Oh. Sorry, Song of Ice and Fire specifically, I must say my favorite part of it, I think, is the dialogue. Yeah. And I I would really like to, you know, take some time one day and just pause and, and take in all the dialogue and see how that's... how he comes up with these things that the people say and the way they say it. It's It's always been quite impressive. So that's something I would like to steal from yeah. George Martin. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I haven't uh, been able to read much more than the first book of the series, but definitely, like, just the way that everything is presented, uh, even though uh, I think we mentioned in a previous podcast there, like, even though not much really happens, it's not boring. Mm. And finding out, like, kind of how they build on the suspense and the characters and stuff like that. Definitely uh, something to be learned there. Mm. And you can even learn from your own work too, like not just looking at other people's writing, but you can look at your own work and if, say, family or friends have read your book, uh, try to get an honest opinion from them on what, areas specifically they really liked or didn't like and if there's like a certain set of chapters like you have a little mini uh, story arc in there and they really liked that for one reason or another you know try and look at that and find out what makes it so good um like i know for instance uh in my first book i definitely got some feedback on like a, a certain area there and um, as far as plot wise, there wasn't really much in there, like definitely some build up for later on in the series, but, mm -hmm. uh, it was more about like, I think the pacing and the action involved. And so like, I've tried to take that and apply that to everything, uh, that I did in the mm -hmm. second book. And hopefully I think it helped a little bit. So, <laughs> hmm. yeah, I, I think I remember that the, the second book's pacing is, is is better definitely mm. so well done <laughs> <laughs> yeah so don't think that uh you just have to read other people's work like you can definitely do it with your own as well mm. and uh one thing uh that kind of we haven't mentioned just yet and, uh, we will definitely go over a little bit later but uh even with having somebody doing a professional edit they might be able to give you a few tips on kind of things that you are doing as well because uh, they definitely have a lot more knowledge and they've seen a lot more books and mm. they might be able to tell you a little bit better on like what works and what doesn't work and uh, just another anecdotal evidence I guess uh, yeah. my first editor before I met you Ethan <laughs> mm -hmm. she uh, basically threw the comments that she gave there uh, she didn't put it in a list, but she did mention like different words that I overused. And so I put them into a list and what I've been doing each time is like, I basically go through that list each time that I'm doing my self edits and I try to change around so that they're stronger, uh, just better words overall that are used instead of the weaker, less descriptive words that I yeah. tend to lean towards. And uh, I think from a editing standpoint there as well, Ethan, you kind of have some general uh, tips that you also go through even just yourself, but also probably give to your, uh, your customers too, I imagine, right? <laughs> mm, yeah, sure. Um, I would call these the, the top three tips for when you self edit. Um, the first thing, probably the most important, is to allow the manuscript some time to rest before you start revising mm -hmm. and editing. That's definitely probably the most important thing. Uh, after you finish your first draft, you know, uh, just put it away for six weeks, maybe two months. Spend that time, don't spend that time thinking about the manuscript the whole time because that will kind of defeat the purpose. But, uh, you know, spend the time doing something else, writing on another first draft, uh, doing just anything other than thinking about this manuscript. And then, when you come back to it, uh, you can have a bit of a fresh perspective, as much as that's possible with your own work. Mm -hmm. So, 
that's definitely the, the first thing I would say. And um, the second one is a bit of, uh, you know, how you go about the self-edit. I would suggest, you know, work from the outside in. You start with a, with a big picture pass where you kind of read your whole uh, manuscript again and just take it in and see what kind of works for you, what doesn't, what, you know, big chunks, maybe move chapters around if they need to. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can maybe go through it again and uh, do like a line edit pass where you fix kind of paragraphs and the, the feeling and some of the mood of the, the scenes and stuff like that. And then finally, you might go through it once more um, to do a polish pass. Just like you said, maybe selecting exactly the right word at the right time and uh, you know, killing off those repeated words that kind of become your favorite word of the day. Yeah. That happens to all of us, I think. <laughs> Um, of course, I mentioned three draw, uh, three passes now, but it's not necessary to stick with just three passes. Um, I would uh, even recommend that you know don't be afraid to do multiple passes uh, for different things. Even though it feels kind of busy work, it feels oh I've read through this thing ten times already. I'm tired. I get it. <laughs> we all become you know tired of our own work. And if you need a break, just take a break. Take a week try to forget about it a bit again and come back to it. But you can do different passes for, you know, one one pass for um, expanding your descriptions if you write lean in your first draft or maybe for contracting your descriptions if you write yeah. a bloated first draft. I know I've got that problem. <laughs> uh, my first draft tends to be really big and too much oh, description. Yeah. <laughs> so that's um, definitely something I always have to look at. And I mean, then you can have another pass for getting your character reactions just right and realistic. That's not always possible to do in the first, you know, first time you go through it, you're kind of focusing on the events sometimes and you don't always focus on things like characters and getting them just right. Yeah, I mean, even the best authors will have several drafts. Uh, I can't remember, uh, it might have been Stephen King again there because... He's always uh, talking about his writing, <laughs> but uh, I know that you know you sometimes even just redo the whole novel several times over. Have sometimes even twelve <laughs> drafts before uh, you would end up having that final draft that you oh. feel kind of satisfied with. And yeah. I know with myself, like uh, sometimes, like what I what I do if I am having trouble with a certain section or uh it just doesn't feel right kind of like one thing that i do is just kind of push past and kind of what you're saying there in your first tip just kind of letting it rest as it were letting that first mm. part that i was having trouble with rest and moving on to the to the next uh part in the novel and then by the time that you're done you can kind of go back and do that big picture pass as it were and rearrange it maybe uh change the chapter around completely or uh, rewrite it, that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, just redo it. And having that time definitely gives you a little bit more perspective. So that's, yeah, that's the most important part. <laughs> and then finally, there's one tip that I, I see repeated often and I found that it really works is, um, when you are going through a self-editing pass in your novel, what you can often do is to read your work uh, out loud to yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, for this kind of exercise, you don't need uh, theatrics or performance. You just read it out loud normally in, in a normal voice. Um, that very often leads you to discover places in the novel where either the pacing or the sentence length or the sentence structure is, is problematic and doesn't sound right. Um, I mean, novels are, they are a visual medium in that sense that there's, there's words, written word involved. But I mean, if you think about where novels come from, originally it was all stories being told around a campfire. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the auditory, uh, dimension of a story is still what is primary. I think when even when you're sitting and reading a book, you're actually hearing the story in your ears as if it's being told to you. 
I, I doubt it's, I doubt you can get away from that. That's just how we are. We, we, <laughs> we are a storytelling race. And, uh, so definitely how the story sounds is still very important. Even if, if you're just going to publish it as, uh, as, you know, written text. And of course, the day's going to come that you're probably going to want some, uh, audiobooks made from your yeah. book. And in that case, well, you know, it's really important to have the story sound good out loud. Mm. Um, and I imagine it can really help with uh, dialogue too, because getting yeah, definitely. getting dialogue right is uh, often probably one of the hardest things to do. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd even suggest doing a separate uh, second pass that you read through, where you just maybe read the narrative parts uh, normally, and then when you get to the dialogues, then you can take this opportunity to maybe act it out a bit and put a bit of the the flavor of the character into the dialogue and see how that sounds. Does that sound right according to the character, what you know about them? Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I definitely think you can have some some play acting going on there, and it might really help you out to get uh, realistic-sounding dialogue. Yeah. (laughs) Mm. And another thing I've found can be really useful, now that we're on the topic of reading your work out loud, is uh, getting someone else to read your work out loud for you. Mm -hmm. That... Also, that has helped me a lot. Uh, I've had it before where I write a piece and I'm not completely sure about it, so I get uh, my fiancé to read it out loud for me. And it, it really helps to get a feel for how another person would read your work. And you also get to hear the places maybe where they're having trouble with uh, some of the words, where maybe they stumble over your words. That's a sign that maybe you need to relook at that part and just tweak it. It's it's you know, you're never gonna win by <laughs> writing prose that you love but that your readers will typically find difficult or, you know, not so great. Yeah, like uh even just kind of going beyond the reading side of things, like one thing uh that I've found I have a couple of programs that I've been using and uh, almost kind of what you were saying there, there's this one program that I've been using called uh, Hemingway Editor. And uh, what it does, like definitely, uh, it it is still programmed, so it's not going to be able to uh, tell you really how to write or how you should write. But uh, with Hemingway, what it does is it um, analyzes kind of the structure of your sentences and it kind of gives you a grading uh, of, uh, if it highlights a yellow, say, yellow means that it's a little hard to read. And then if it's red, then it's really hard mm-hmm. to read. And so kind of <laughs> almost the same thing as uh, getting someone else to read it and almost seeing where they stumble. Like this can kind of help you identify specifically like the sentences that might be a little too long or a little bit too complex and kind of trying to mm-hmm. don- tone that down. Um, what I've been doing with it is just specifically focusing on the red ones, just the ones that are really hard because I've found that the, the ones that are a little hard to read are just basically, they have a couple commas in it. (laughs) They're a little bit longer (laughs) than normal there. So you definitely, uh, it's still going to be up to you to decide whether or not to accept those suggestions. Um, but they definitely can help and. Uh, another program, say, that I've used, uh, it's called Smart Edit. And uh, almost kind of what we were saying before about the word list, it'll actually go through your text and show it'll show you if you're using certain words too much or using certain phrases too much. And it'll give you like a number breakdown of uh, how many times you've used that in your text. One thing that I kind of wish it did was like uh, the density. Like, if you use a certain word in a particular paragraph like five times, <laughs> that would be a, a, definitely a good update for that. But it can kind of give you an overall feel of that. Hmm. So there's definitely programs that you can use to kind of assist in that. So uh, don't think that you have to just get by on your your own knowledge and that sort of thing. There's lots of different things that can help you out with it. Um, there are some books that can also help you out. Um, there's, of course, the 
or the perennial one is uh, Revision and Self-Editing by James Scott Bell, which is kind of a, a very nice uh, book that uh, guides you a bit and, you know, gives practical tips and tricks of how to do it, but uh, also a bit of motivation. You seem to be reading a lot of his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there's another book that I got very recently. I haven't progressed past the second chapter, but it, it looks quite good so far. It's called Manuscript Makeover by Elizabeth Lyon. Okay. And um, so far that's been, been giving a couple of pretty solid tips how to go through revision, um, what to do, what not to do, what to keep your eyes open for. So I'm, I'll be very keen to finish that book and yeah. see. There's definitely lots of different books on grammar. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, I I don't uh, read too much there, but I, I do have <laughs> on my shelf uh, a couple that were recommended. Uh, Elements of Style by uh, William Strunk Jr. and mm. uh, E.B. White. That one... I think it's uh, heavily rated on Amazon there. And uh, mm-hmm. On Writing Well by William uh, Zinser, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not too sure. Uh, but definitely I've heard a, a lot of different places recommending those. Uh, so if mm-hmm. if you've read them already there, audience, then you are already ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> At least a little bit there. I definitely have to get that. On writing well. That seems like an interesting yeah. one. Hopefully someday I'll actually get around to reading them there. <laughs> I know what to get you for Christmas. <laughs> oh, I already have it. It's just gathering dust. <laughs> oh, jeez. Then I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some ways that you can help. And uh, one of those oh, ways, yeah. uh, as we've mentioned there, Ethan is an editor. And uh, what we definitely want to say there, we're not just you know, giving a shameless plug here to uh, his services, but you definitely need to have an editor, regardless of what you do. Like You can definitely do a lot of uh, things with your own manuscript that an editor wouldn't be able to necessarily do, but in the end, when you want to get that final draft, having somebody who, you know, has uh, had that professional look on your book, you definitely want to have that. And uh, Ethan has his own editing services there, and uh, he has a lot of different things that he can do. Why don't, uh, why don't I let the uh, professional here go over his services? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, just a quick mention. Uh, one thing I just want to mention is, you know, I've often wondered why it's so difficult to edit your own work. And uh, just a quick Google search actually reveals it's, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, there's there's a thing called confirmation bias, which is related. The problem is when you write your first draft, you are obviously writing it the way that you believe it should be written, which is not bad. That's perfectly normal human behavior. But then the problem is when you read through it afterwards, you tend to see what you intended to write and not necessarily what you did write. Mm. And uh, I mean, no one's immune to this. I edit other people's books for a living and still when I finish my book I have to go out and find an editor because I cannot edit my own mm-hmm. work it just doesn't work that way so that's kind of uh, just one of those things you'll never catch everything so uh, never 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 for your own work um, so I do personally love the projects where I can see the author took some time to self-edit and you know the manuscript they give me is pretty polished um, that's always good, and it, it, it's the mark of an author that that really wants to improve and get get better. And you know what these people do? Uh, over time, they do definitely get better. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I'm look. I'm never going to complain if there's a lack of self editing in a manuscript that someone gives me. <laughs> I mean, it's my job to edit it. So either way, it doesn't matter. I will <laughs> I will edit anything. Um, but definitely when, when someone gives me a manuscript that's extra low effort for me, you know, I, I kind of feel bad charging them full <laughs> price. So I tend to throw in an after-the-fact discount there on uh, some well-polished manuscripts. It, uh, it definitely happens. And 
It's pretty great. Mm. So if you're interested in uh, editing services, um, I do run a little website over at uh, silverjmedia.com. And I work in pretty much all genres. I offer content critiques as well as uh, proofreading. Um, and even even blurbs for the book. Um, the website that we've got up it shows uh, you know it offers easy ways to see the costs involved in any project, how much um, the charges are, and I also offer free sample edits so that I, we can give you an idea you know of what you might expect in a full edit. And also because our services are divided into tiers, that you can select just what you need and nothing more. Uh, the sample edit really helps to show you which services can benefit your manuscript the most. So you don't take services that you end up not really utilizing. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, so just basically the last little bit on that. I, uh, you can definitely work on your own book there and make it as strong as you can. But a good professional editor is going to help you save time money and embarrassment so it's something that is definitely necessary to do and uh why don't you guys let us know as well if you have any tips there on what you do to self-edit your own uh, works there and thank you again for joining us here at second drafts podcast please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write edit and publish your way and let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. And we'll see you next time. Cool. Cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.